Welcome to Occupations, the podcast, where we discuss what it's like to hold specific jobs. Occupations is brought to you by LotsOfMaps.com, where you fulfill your vintage map gifting needs. Visit LotsOfMaps.com. I'd had a bad night. I mean, a night so bad I thought I was king of the world. And I drank till daylight. I mean, I never stopped once until my hands finally fell. And I fought my daytime self with a mighty dose of, hey, look at nighttime me. And I never do win that battle. But I fight it over and over and over and over, it seems. And I saw an old man smiling on a park bench feeding the pigeons. My head was spinning. And as my young body ached, I wished for an old man's vision. And I watched the way he moved slow, serene, and lucky to be alive. Thought to myself, I'm never going to make it that far with, with too many more nights like last night. And I'd rather be 75 and sunny than acting like I'm 17 and freezing again. I'd rather be up early in the morning been up late at night again erasing memories of where I've been Or to be through at 52 someday stone face and bleary eyed You better believe I'm living for the moment But my moment's growing bigger by and by Hey and welcome Andy Jaglins are here for Occupations uh, Thanks so much for joining us I am live here at Rosabella's Cafe, which is the first time we've really done it on on the road in public. And uh, I'm here with Ryan Montblue. Hi, Ryan. How are you? I'm all right. Good to be here in Salem. Yeah, we are in Out Rosabella's in, in Salem on Church Street. And they have, uh, can you rate the BLT? The BLT was delicious. I thought, you know, less is more kind of a thing. It was, yeah, I don't know. I would rate, oof, I give it an eight. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. I'm, I'm having the iced tea. I give that like a nine, nine point. Nice. Oh, two, four. Mm-hmm. That's what I give it. I give this um, coffee a 10. Wow. And I had a coffee earlier today. You know what I give that? 10. And I had a coffee yesterday mm-hmm. and it was really bad and I give that a 10. Wow. Yep. You're a tough, <laughs> tough grader. <laughs> Uh, Ryan is here, and he's going to tell us a little bit about being a musician. That's the occupation of the month that we're going to talk about. By the way, we are over a year now we've been doing this, so congratulations to us. Hey! And um, uh, we, we're having birthday. a good time. Thank you. We're, uh, we're having a good time doing it, and we're learning a lot. So for those of you who are interested in taking part in one of these occupations hopefully we'll have a little bit more educational stuff for you and and things moving forward so ryan let's talk music um, let's do it so how would you describe your your musical style i have the most trouble with this question yeah <laughs> i wish i had a i always wished over the years i could be like yeah we do retro post-punk or whatever <laughs> like some kind of quick yeah. i don't know i'm a singer songwriter uh you know i just told the lady behind the counter i was like because i have to answer that question a lot and I was like, I don't know, I'm kind of like a folky guy, but I have a band too, and I, I, I do, I don't know, I think I cover some different styles. I'm not a rock band, really. I'm, I don't know, as you can tell by my winding answer, I don't really know. <laughs> but I'm, a, you know, I'm a singer songwriter. I write, I write songs. It's really, you know, centered on the lyrics, and um, I don't know. I just try to put my heart and soul into every song. So let's try it from a different approach. <laughs> Who are your uh, influences? Uh, Martin Sexton. Is a big one. Excellent. Paul Simon, uh, Deb Talon, who's half of the Weepies. I uh, love her. She's one of my absolute favorites ever. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's a, there's so much. But I'm also, I've also listened to a lot of like hip hop in my life and growing up in the 90s and just, uh, you know, when I was a little kid growing up, my two favorite bands were ACDC and New Edition, if you could call New Edition <laughs> a band. So I've always had this like diverging <laughs> styles that were okay, you know. Um, so yeah, I guess you. Yeah. That's excellent. Um, all right, so let's talk about what it's like being a musician. So let's start at the beginning. When did you get a little bit of interest in music? At what age are we talking about there? Well, so 
my I got a guitar for Christmas when I was like eight from my dad with a little amp, and he had played um, in college, and he would play like. I saw him play like he would play like a Fourth of July gig every year, and and he would play like wedding gigs, but it was not this. It was like you know his bass was in the closet. It's not like he was out practicing. All it was just a thing that was kind of existed, but it wasn't in my face. And then he gave uh, me a guitar for Christmas. Gave my brother a keyboard. I think eventually my brother played bass. But so that was like the beginning. And then by the time I was graduating high school, I was like. You know, pick up the guitar, put it down. I never really like, practiced a lot, but it was a thing that was around. I could do a couple things and play for a girl on the phone or something, you know. That's what and, it's uh, all about, right? <laughs> not like a serenade either. I'd play like the beginning of Wipeout, not very well, and that was it, you know. Um, but then I went to college. I went to Villanova, and um, and I was super depressed, and my roommate had a much nicer guitar than I had, and I just stayed and played his guitar. Like, I would, my, my friends would make fun of me. They'd come back 10 hours later. I'm still playing guitar in the room, in the dorm room. And uh, again, like, not so much, like, practicing, like, trying to get down this part and learn this. It was just playing. It was always just play, play, play. It just felt so good to play, and I would play a lot of blues, and a kid down the hall showed me some pentatonic scales. And, uh, you know, he came back after the next summer into, you know, into my sophomore year. And he was like, that ain't what I taught you, man. He was like from the South. He was this this wild dude. Uh, But, yeah, and I just kept playing and playing and playing. And then I was like writing poetry and I went from a chemical engineering major to an economics major to an English major. And then I was like writing, getting like deep into like just writing and feeling so much stuff and and playing and then I started to sing my like senior year when I was 21 so then I was getting out of college and I was like you know and everyone's asking you what are you gonna do and I was like I think I want to make music you know so it just was the perfect I needed you know I was so thankful to have like you know four years in school to figure it out right right and I mean I don't know what I want to do when I grow up either so yeah I mean you know no me I'm uh, still trying to figure it out absolutely we all are um so no lessons self-taught uh well I've gone back since and gotten lessons you know like I um but yeah I mean uh just just like nothing like too regular but like yeah, here and there, I've gone back and taken lessons with some incredible people. My buddy Stefan Rumbel is like a gypsy jazz guy, and I like would go to his apartment and in, in uh, uh, every week, and when he was in Boston for like a few months, and just learn a little bit of that, take a little bit here, a little bit there, and then learn. You know, I'd have Lyle Brewer show me something or something. You know, I just have had f- contact with great people over the years, so just you know, trying to learn. And I took like an online chords 101 berkeley class or something just trying to do something i always wish i had a little more formal training but you know trying to learn as i go i always like those that don't um musically (laughs) because they they're raw i like the rawness of it i I honestly that's just my own opinion but um i like the fact that it's it's not exactly what it's supposed to be quote unquote it's it's you know your own thing you know yeah, that's a lot of the best stuff as people express it. But you never it's never a bad thing to learn stuff too. But I know what you mean. Like people can fall into the trap of yeah, just having to sound like exactly what they learn. Where, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not yeah. I'm not putting that down by any means, but that's my own personal preference. I like yeah. the the raw people. The raw people. <laughs> I like raw people. <laughs> sure. All right, that's cool. So when did you start to get the itch to, did you record first or did you play out first? I would imagine play out. Yeah, it was always playing out. It was always like, uh, so I got out of college and then then I was like, okay, I know I want to do that. I just knew, I was like, all right, I'm, you know, I, 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 I remember I, I cut off the tip of my finger at the, my first and only day at, at, uh, the ski shop that I worked at, and then I ground off the tip of my finger, went into Salem Hospital here, and uh, they were like, uh, what's your occupation? I was like, musician. You know, I was very, like, just new, you know, this is what I do. Uh, and my finger ended up being okay, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway. It's what makes you special, though, right? I mean, it You're, kind of did actually yeah. lend itself to a style that I developed. Like, it, hmm. it's, I ground off the tip of my right index finger. Wow. And then I, when I finger pick, I do this kind of slappy thing where I don't use that finger. And hmm. that was at the time where I was kind of, like, sort of coming into that. So I think it did have something to do with cool. it. Um, so but, you'd suggest for people to cut off their finger if they want to yeah, be a musician. Yeah, no, don't, don't do that. 
<laughs> yeah, I know. Work for Jerry Garcia. Work for Tony Iommi. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. No, uh, <laughs> I was freak. I was really freaked out because I, I knew at the time that's all I wanted to do was play. But um, wait, I feel like I got sidetracked. So. Uh, what was the question? Playing out. Playing out. <laughs> Playing out was the thing. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I got out of college and I was like, and I got a job at the House of Blues, the old original House of Blues in Harvard Square, and um, which I had tried to do the summer before, but they wouldn't take me just for a summer. But I knew I, I was just kind of drawn to that place. And then I was like, I knew I just wanted to, that place had live music seven nights a week from all over the world. And... I just wanted to see what went on. And it also was good. I think it's good for anybody to work in a restaurant at some point, work at a bar, like work in service at some point in your life. Not everybody does, but I think it helps like everyone. And I just like saw all these things. I just, and I worked the, in the ticket box office and I scrubbed the bars and I, that helped a lot to like see what went on. Sure. And then I would just take any gig I could get. I bust a little bit in Harvard Square, like in the subway and stuff, but I was more like playing like just really shitty bar gigs and and some better ones. There was a place down in Faneuil Hall I would play, and there was um, I would play the TGI Fridays in Danvers that is no more. I played the Starbucks in Boston on Boylston Street. Mm -hmm. I played like every anywhere I could. You know, I'd get like a matinee at the House of Blues eventually and play right. there on a Saturday afternoon when I got the gall to walk up to Teo and give him my my demo tape and, and which was a tape so then I started getting opening gigs in in the house of blues because I was you know and but also playing my crappy bar gigs and then it was kind of just just sheer repetition mm. of like play anywhere I could do you remember your first time on stage uh, yeah I was in college you know when I was in fifth grade actually we did a we did a talent show and we lip-synced me and my buddy Kevin Dan Brozier who's still who's back in Peabody now we did the Blues Brothers, dressed up like the Blues, Blues Brothers and lip synced, and I'm like, Hold. so there's a picture, so there's something there, you know. Yeah. But then, uh, yeah, no, when I when I was in college, I was like, you know, third guitar player in my jam band kind of thing, like not knowing what the hell I was doing. I was second guitar player, and then I showed up late for a gig, and there was another guy on stage, so I was the third, you know, I was just like a bunch of stupid college kids, like doing, you know, getting stoned and playing, you know. So that was like I was on stage with that, and then my senior year. I kept being like, I think I can sing, and they're like, okay, I'll we'll sing, what are, you know. And I, I could really like, a voice is such a, it's such a personal, heavy thing in a way. So like, I finally let out, like little by little, was able to let out like this kind of singing voice I had in my head alone in the car. And then I just kind of, it was hard to get the gall to do it. And then eventually, I remember doing it at this club in Conshohocken, in Pennsylvania, that we used to play. And I just, for the first time, sang. And I remember, like, looking up and seeing, like, this, like I'm looking at right now, like a microphone in front of me, and then my friends were in the distance. And I just, I do remember having a moment of, like, okay, I'm, I'm going to have to get used to this. This right. is a thing right. that's going to keep happening. I was going to ask you about nerves, and, I mean, yeah. I don't know whether you still get nervous at all, but... Yeah. Um, I mean, what were the nerves like in the oh, first few times you hit the stage? Oh, you yeah, know? I'm sure just scared shitless. I mean, now I say I get nervy, not nervous kind of thing. You know, it's like some butterfly. You know, I think it's natural to be like, all right, get a little freaked out before a set or something. Sure. But, but you know, then when I get up there now, it's the most comfortable place in the world. Usually, you know, some nights it isn't. But, uh, yeah, then it was just, I remember reading early on a thing about, uh, I think it was Adam Sandler in an interview was like, you know, everything in your body tells you not to go on the stage <laughs> and then you just force yourself to do it. Right, and you right. just, by repetition of forcing yourself to do it over and over, eventually it becomes really comfortable, but right. you need reps to do it. So I would do a lot, like a ton of open mics. I did the burn every Tuesday in Somerville and then I would do the Kells across town. And through both of those, I met like dear friends who I'm still friends with and, and just, you know, it was like, I still think open mics are so great like I'll, yeah. I'll do them if I got a chance that's know? awesome but, um, but yeah like it's cause it's it's reps you know get up there and do it and right. then I would try different songs the next week and just try stuff you know that's what it's there for and it's like a supportive environment so yeah it took a while yeah, and I sure. think it, it's like this weird thing where it, you know it's like you're scared but you also have this irrational confidence too mm. there's something that gets you up there that you know some part of me is like super scared and freaked out some part of me is also like i'm the shit i'm gonna get up there you know and that part gets worn down too i think in a good way sure. where, you, where you it's like this weird mixing of humility and confidence it's that's gotta be a good balance like, and that's what keeps you you know what's the word keeps me from being a jerk yeah I, you know <laughs> 
Okay, that's yeah. good. That's not a bad thing. <laughs> no. So far, so good. Awesome. So, so let's talk a little bit about writing. You said you were writing in college a little bit? Yeah, I started writing first, and I, and I really, like, the bug just bit me to write. I was sitting in the back of chemistry class freshman year writing poems, and I was like, all right, something's amiss here. And then I, you know, and I was just really, like, I would just walk around campus and cry and write poems, and, you know, I was just, like, kind of, you know, a little college kid. But it was, I was feeling things deeply, and I, yeah, and then eventually I took, like, some amazing, like, English courses when I switched to the business school, and that was like, I was like, oh, there's something here, and then I just switched to English and, and graduated on time and was in English my last two years, and that was amazing. Like, I had some amazing professors. I would really just study poetry and just get into also my own poetry at the same time, and just, I really felt it deeply. It was a really, it was a calling or something, like, I had to write it wasn't just like, oh, let me check that out. It was like I just had to do it. And then eventually I, I started singing. So, you know, as I was graduating, it was like, okay, I play guitar and I write and I'm singing. What does that mean? I, I think I'm a singer-songwriter. I literally was like, I that's, think... I believe that's the definition. Yeah, yeah. I think that's it's those three things. <laughs> I used, they used to be my symbols. I had those symbols made of like a pen and a microphone and a guitar. It's like those are the three, right. you know, the things. Um, but the writing is, yeah, I mean... You know, it's kind of central to the whole thing that I do. And and I had great moments when I was in college of just, like, I remember where I was when I was, like, I don't know, I just kind of recognized honesty on some level, which is a deep well of, like, no, I should just tell the truth. You know, you, you just kind of, especially when you're young, you, you don't really know who you are yet, and so you, you'll embellish or whatever, sure. which I still do. It's not like I'm pure of that now, but sure. but I remember this moment of like, no, tell the truth. Like, don't just to try to do that, you know, and, and then another moment of like, well, other people's stories are good, but I, I need to tell my own truth. And just these big moments of like sort of epiphanies or some kind of a threshold to walk through of like, no, I really want to do this and kind of speak my own truth. And if I do that well enough, it connects with other people's. Well, let me ask you, um, what percentage of your music now really comes from your experiences versus, uh, you know, telling a story about somebody else or making yeah. up a story? That's a really good question. I mean, I think I, that's a really good question. I think uh, it probably as I go on, I would think it gets a little less about like my direct experience. You know, I remember reading early on like Paul, and I saw Paul Simon speak about this. Our job is not to tell you what's going on with our lives it's to find the truth in the song that could involve something very real from your life uh but it doesn't have to and you have license in the song to kind of find the truth you know right like i have a song called 75 and sunny that i wrote a long time ago and and i i say i have a best friend uh she don't drink or smoke like i've been known to and she's got religion and she's a one woman dynamo and lights up every room she goes to that's my friend audubon i love her that's a true thing nice i wouldn't I mean, she lights up rooms for me, and she's like, you know, she 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 is a, a light like that. But that wouldn't be the first way I would describe her if I was going to really literally describe my friend. She just lights up every room she goes to. But I only had this line to make a point in the song sure. of like, hey, she's got religion, but she's cool. Like, she just lights things up. So, you know what I mean? Like, little things Absolutely. like that that you find ways to color things in a song that while still maintaining the truth of it just to get the point across well i mean you, you can't be a hundred percent no I mean, it would gotta, get pretty boring if right I, yeah, yeah totally oh, but I, I but i have some stuff that's you know that really you know my last record is like i don't want to go i have a song you know and it's like i'm uh, t it's called i don't want to go and i'm <clears throat> talking about like a you know the first verse is about like a mushroom trip on on martha's vineyard and you know, that's very real. But I changed the date because it rhymed better. <laughs> so, you know, I changed the year. <laughs> Stuff like that, you know. No, so it's great. it's it's interesting, like, what's there to use and, you know, and I don't know. That's just the, that's part of the craft, I guess. Cool. Your style of singing is, well, in writing and singing, but you use a lot of words. Your word count <laughs> in songs is mm -hmm. tremendous. Um, and not every song, but, uh, you know, in hanging out with you a, a little bit, I've noticed that you have no problem recalling uh, an insane amount of words that actually, and maybe you made it all up in front of me when you were doing it, but I don't think so. I no, think you got it pretty good. There's a lot of how the hell do you remember so much? I don't know. That's a, I, thank you for thank you for saying that. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I do think um, I I don't know. I think I just remember words. I can I can sometimes remember 
like a line from a movie that I saw once, like 30 years ago, mm-hmm. kind of thing. There's, I do have, I think, some innate ability to just remember stuff. And then also that's part of the job. Like, yeah. I still use cheat sheets and stuff when I'm covering something or, or you know, I'll screw up a song that I've been playing for 20 years if I'm not, if I don't have my head in the game. So, but I don't know. I think this, yeah, I don't know. I think I can just do it. I think that's part of the, part of the deal. Yeah, that's amazing. And uh, I think like I've tried to go over the years well, it's ebbed and flowed, but you know, there's something to be said for saying more with less. So I've sure. tried to like pare down the words, and and I've done that, and now I think it's moving back the other way, where I'm saying a lot. I've you know, I had the band drop these like kind of hip hop beats, sort of, and I was like, just I got him in the studio and did that, and then I was like, what the hell am I going to do over this? I just had some like, vague sense that I wanted to do something, not vague, but and then I did it. I started writing like on the next record. It's it's almost getting into rapping but some of the stuff um so that requires a lot of words a lot so and i think you know there's pl- there's place for both all right let's um let's shift gears a little bit let's talk a little bit about the business the business the business it's not a wonderful business <laughs> <laughs> ever, no one has anything good to say about the music business ever what's the quote from like uh it's like uh like Spinal Tap or something like that. Hunter S. Thompson as one of like the, you know, the music business is full of, read that, look up that quote. It's like full of pimps and monsters and all, you know, but then it also has a bad side. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, no one has anything good to say about yeah. it. You have not been signed to a label. You've done all your recording on your own, except recently, I, I understand. But um, what made you make that decision? I mean, it was really necessity. It's not like... I had some virtuous moment where I was presented with this fantastic deal and I said, no, I want to do it on my own. I just, I never got that deal. I got some crappy deals, you know, (laughs) or I had, it would seem to be a good deal and then it wouldn't happen or something. I just never, you know, so it was like, and I was honestly, Martin Sexton was inspiring. When I first found Martin Sexton, like just as a model of a, and as music and just then I, you know, I'm sitting in the, in the little uh, box office at the House of Blues working which was a little closet under the stairs was the t- was the ticket booth and mm-hmm. I was just like early internet like looking up Martin Sexton and being blown away by like he did it all one room at a time and he sold like 20,000 CDs out of his trunk or whatever it was that was so inspiring to me to be like and it, working in a club where I saw just bands that you know weren't household names but to be a room full of people every night getting down to like to some band that they loved and it was like there was all this room to like okay go play shows yeah just one room at a time doing it on your own mm. was um yeah i, I mean that's so, not an easy decision to make it's it's a lot more work you, i mean i'm sure you would rather just be playing music and not have to worry about all that other I stuff know. i still am like that yeah but it's it was just the most direct. It was the most like I can go play an open mic tonight, you know, instead right. of like waiting. I have friends who have gone the other route, you know. Um, my friend Julian is an amazing singer songwriter. Julian Villard. He he grew up in New York. He's he's worked really hard, but he's gone the other route. He's gotten major label deals, and he's gotten. I've just like just been squeaking along. It's like the tortoise in the hair or something. And then yeah. he would. I mean, there's, you know, all different paths to get there. But for me, it was just direct. It was like, I need to go play. I just, you know, so I would play all those crappy bar gigs. I would play for anybody who would listen. I would keep my email list and I would keep in touch with them. I would, I would, you know, talk to people and just take any gig I could and just like, because I knew I needed the reps of actually playing too. And then just building it that way. You know, so any deal I got was like, I don't know, just some like kind of, bad thing that was very clear I shouldn't sign, which there wasn't much of that either. But right. I did, you know, I sat in a boardroom at some label in New York and they all just like listened to a track that I had made and some people, you know, really liked it. Some people pretended they did. Some some guy was just rolling his eyes and I was just like, what am I doing here? You know? <laughs> and they said, yeah, it looks good. And then they, nothing would happen. I went to like some guy's like penthouse apartment in Manhattan. There's some fat guy with a cigarette, with a, with a cigar, literally like a, like a mogul. I forget his name, you know, but he's like, I'm blown away by you, kid. You know, <laughs> it's like nothing would happen, you know, but yeah. I do my gig in New York and then I right. do, you know, I. I auditioned for the first season of America's Got Talent, which nobody knew. I didn't know what it was at the time. It wasn't on the air yet. I had this amazing audition thing at 
bb kings in manhattan and uh all these amazing acts in the middle of the day and or the early morning all uh, auditioning and, and i got calls back they wanted me to go to like la and shoot again and meet with these producers and and they sent like a 50 page contract that was complete <laughs> like sign your life away like to, you know and i had gigs when they wanted me to go right and I was like, no, nah, I can't do it. I got gigs. I don't, you know, it's like, even if I yeah. would win the contest sure. with what you're sending me, I don't know. I got enough yeah. going on right now that I don't want to mm-hmm. sign my life away. So, you know, I've had pretty easy decisions with that. It's, yeah. and it's more just like, I was so inspired by the grassroots thing of like Martin and stuff and, and just, you know, just go play one room at a time. Well, and I know a lot of people would probably give up after that, you know, mm-hmm. the, having the contract, the big contract <clears throat> and imagining yourself on a... A stage in a stadium you know we all had yeah. that dream at totally. one point i still and, do yeah, of course. <laughs> maybe without the contract but i still think about red rocks and stuff i want to sure. do it sure and I'm, i think i could yeah i bet you could <clears throat> i'm just thinking of like to to pull up your bootstraps and realize okay i'm gonna have to book my own gigs i'm gonna <laughs> have to record my own stuff and pay for it i'm gonna you know have to travel on my own in my own car and uh, maybe even get my own band together in order to, to mm-hmm. make my thing happen and, and spend some money to do it. But y- you're keeping everything yours. So let's mm-hmm. talk a little bit about that. So let's talk about how the music business works a little bit. And I know, you know, there's no definitive way that it works. But tell us a little bit about when a record company signs you. Mm-hmm. Th- I know there's different things here. You've got the recorded rights to a song. Mm-hmm. You've got the publishing rights to the song, which means the the actual rights to any version of that song. Yep. Um, the writing. Right. And then separately, you've got your live part that you're doing, all mm-hmm. the any kind of money you're making in venues and such. Yep. So how does that work? How does the business generally work in that way? Well, I'm probably not the best guy to ask because I've only done it my way. But, uh, I mean, generally... Uh, like if a label signs you, it used to be like, you know, they would take like 85% of the money or something like that. And you get, and they might give you an advance, but then you pay that back through your record sales and stuff. This is all a model going back forever. I don't know how it's, I mean, it's changed in recent years where they do 360 deals cause they weren't making any money on that. So they take part of your touring and they take part of your merch. The thing that you get with a label is like, to me has always been like, you know, a team of professional people working to get you out there and to market you and to, and that all that stuff is important. As I go on, I have a good, um, you know, management team now that I work with for a while and, and they're good at, at, especially at my level, marketing my shows. It's like, I, that term sounds so, I don't even want to utter it from my lips. It sounds so, you know, they're going to get the marketing, but it's so important. It's and they make sure my little shows sell out. Like it's, right. they, they can't completely control it, but it really helps a lot to like spread the word. So it's like, if you have a label, you have a team of people that are pushing you out there that are getting, and then it's like the whole world of like, I mean, they're still kind of on top of that, the getting you on the radio, which is still a thing, getting you on these huge Spotify playlists is still a thing that labels have some control over. I've had some success with that, but it's mostly been by luck and just sheer like being on the radar of people by getting my name out there, you know. So they will they will own your master recordings too. They own the recordings. You know, you if you wrote the song, you own the publishing of that song, which means that you could do other versions of it people could pay you to do their own versions of it things along the lines of that yeah if it gets covered by anyone you you basically own the composition of that song there's the composition of the music and there's the composition of the words right. and those are split 50 50 or 100 100 they call it but um that doesn't add up that i know it's, it's the music <laughs> business okay they're like hey let's make it 200 we can make it's more money off these people totally let's make it 300 um it's honestly still confusing to me, you know, it's still like, but there is like, there's a difference between the recording, owning the recording and owning the composition of the song. It's almost right. like the, you know, the sheet music and the lyrics. So I've been lucky enough to, you know, my friend Julian, who I referenced earlier, he's like, man, he's like, it's like, you've just crawled through the tunnel of shit all these years and you come out on the other side, like Andy Dufresne and just have all your masters <laughs> and stuff, you know, and, and I, and that's been the advantage of like sticking this out in the way I have and just. I paid for all those recordings. I own all those recordings. Right. I, I wrote all those songs. I own all those songs. I have, you know. Um, On the flip side, you are sort of stuck in a contract in a way, too, if you were to sign a, a deal. 
if that label decided, eh, we're not going to put as much effort into this guy anymore because his first record didn't do so great. Totally. Um, or and just shelf you altogether. Exactly. I mean, I heard, I was like, I mean, I, I've been hearing those stories since I, since before I was doing music. So it's, it was very much in the consciousness of like, be careful what you sign. Don't do it, you know. Yeah. And I've had friends been shelved. Like, I mean, like, you know, brilliant. It still goes on, you know. Like, right. I was just out touring with. He did the Nashville thing for a while, and he's brilliant. And he had, like, this incredible record they made that just, like, hasn't seen the light of day because they couldn't get it all behind it. So, you know, he's putting him out on his own now and doing his thing. And, yeah, it's a weird thing. People who can go that route, more power to them. It can be fine. Yeah. And it can really get you out there, and it can... You know, it's a different level of things. I sold out five shows last week, and, you know, it was probably 100 people a night, you know? But it sold out, and it was great, and they were loving You know, so it's just different levels of things. I still have ambitions to, you know, do bigger, and I get to do bigger things sometimes. Yeah, there's room for all of it, I think, you know? It's going to make you feel good, though, knowing that you're so kind of doing it all. And I know you got a management company doing some of your stuff, but the fact that you're... You know, you're not just taking credit for the music, but you're also taking credit for all the other things that a, a label would be doing, and it, it must feel good to kind of do all of that. It feels terrible. It fe <laughs> no. <laughs> I hate it. I hate. I just want to make me. <laughs> no, it does. It is gratifying at the end of the day that yeah. I've done. You know, like yeah. I mean, for me, I don't know. I just. Right. Once I got out of school and knew that I, I just knew that I wanted to do this. So yeah. it was like I just got shot out of the cannon to do it. So 10 years in a van in a trailer with my original band doing 200 shows a year. 10 years since then putting together other bands, doing as many shows as I could. In a year. You know, I'm still going. I'll be in Florida in a few days. I'll be on a cruise after that. I'll be in Saratoga after that. I'll be, you know, just a lot of bouncing around and it's it has its drawbacks. Um, sure. But that's life. I mean, we all have... Yeah, things like that like, going on. At the end of the day, yeah. I got the best job in the world. I really, I love, love my job. That's terrific. I love that. Lotsofmaps.com. Vintage, local, national, and world maps for an affordable price. 99% of our maps are $25 or less. Great as gifts. Frame them or put them under glass for your home, vacation home, or as a memory of a special place. Lotsofmaps.com. Let's make a movie. About our lives You can take the pictures I'll make it sound right You can be the director We can set the scene Let's make a movie about you and me Let's talk a little bit about writing. Um, mm -hmm. You've been doing it since uh, college or maybe even slightly before that. What does it take to do uh, to write a song, I mean, are you do you start with lyrics? Do you start with music? Is there a, is there a formula to it, or is it just something you hear in the middle of the night uh, in your dreams, or uh, it, or does it vary? Yeah, it can't it uh, for me? I mean, it's obviously different for everybody. Um, like when Randy Newman writes a song, he doesn't. I was reading like he doesn't get a bolt of inspiration driving down the street and he uses he goes in and work he goes to his office which is like at his piano and stuff and he goes to work when he's working he's writing when he's not he's not writing right i'm kind of always got the radar up for little bits of information little bits of inspiration and and i'm always kind of writing down little scraps of things in my notebook and my phone recording little snippets of things just getting ideas when they come and then the hard part is like sitting down and doing the work after that and finishing it so usually for me the music comes first and i can kind of hear something how i want it to sound how i would like to sing it or i play something on the guitar that i like that feels good that i hear a melody over and i i kind of hear it first i teach songwriting and stuff and i encourage people to this is other thing a thing other people have definitely taught but it's like you know, you're just encouraged to, like, make a joyful noise, like mumble. It oftentimes comes out as gibberish at first, but you can hear these words kind of, like, trying to come out. Then you sit down and kind of sketch it out and try. I'll try. I mean, some songs you get lucky and you get, you, you get a blessing, you get a gift, and it comes out in an hour or something like that. Sometimes some of these songs take me years, you know. Yeah. I, I'll write. 25 different lines for each line or something, you know, and I just keep will keep sketching it out or I'll be driving and a verse will pop into my head and I'll work out like, oh, that'd be a good way to like, and I find some phrase that I like and I just kind of build it little by little. And in the end, it sounds like it's just all coming out at once. But for me, it takes a long time, you know. 
And that, I'm not alone in that either. I mean, you know, um, uh, I mean, Leonard, not to compare myself to Leonard Cohen, but Leonard Cohen would take 10, 15 years to write some songs. He wrote, right. what, 65 verses to Hallelujah and stuff. <laughs> I mean, he, you know, and it, it's kind of like you, you sort of have this. And he, he would talk about doing, you know, he, he would have like brilliant lines and verses and stuff that would be as good as anything I will ever write in my life and he wouldn't use them because he would he would be like there's a lie in there somewhere that I can't get over there's some kind of you know that thing of finding the truth is like this never ending kind of digging sure. what about <laughs> writer's block you ever had it <laughs> no I mean I think I'm just denial denial that I remember no I, I think I've been pretty lucky where it's where it comes out at least a little by little and then there are those times where you're kind of beating your head against the wall and it seems like nothing's happening, but usually when you do that, something is happening uh, kind of under the surface, and then if you take a break, it'll kind of work itself out a little bit. I just feel like, I don't know, I haven't run into a situation where I felt like any of the work was wasted, you know? Like, so if I show up and do the work and get into some kind of rhythm, especially when it, especially like it helps if I have a deadline or something, if I go in and do the work every day, good things will happen. Oh, there's the bell. <laughs> Sorry. Oh no, you're good. You want to come do a little something? <laughs> Feel free. Freaking out the locals here in Salem. Um, so, do you use pen and paper? Do you use a recording device? What What do you? Are I, you just doing it by memory? Uh, I do all of that. I mean, I I, uh, I always have a notebook and pen, and I do a lot of notes on my phone and and voice memos and do. I work. I have like. Word files on my computer, and then we'll get the final lyrics and things that you know. So, I kind of use all those things, you know. And some of it's in my memory, but I, you really gotta try to get it down because then those times when you say you're gonna remember it, you really don't remember it quite the same way. So, the recording is really good for just getting melodies down and stuff. One time I was doing a, the first time I did a Vipassana meditation course, I was in there for 10 days, and you're not supposed to write. You can't talk, and you, there's no, you're in noble silence, and you're not really supposed to write or read or whatever. And I would be like, taking a break from the meditation hall stuff and get this like song idea and I couldn't write it and it was killing me but I had to just repeat I probably shouldn't have done this either but I would just repeat it in my head and like so I memorized it so there's always a way yeah <laughs> so I, I'd forget something in like two minutes I don't know how <laughs> well, I got you yeah, I don't, I, tell me I'll I remember it sometimes I don't know my own name so um, Sandy that's a, oh thank you yeah thank you I know this is a terrible question, and there is no answer to this. What's your day like? I mean, I know oh. every day is probably totally different, but yeah. how about the, the legends of, you know, rock stars not getting up till noon? I mean, are you, uh, that's are you true. in that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I, uh, that's a valid question. It's, I'm a, I have trouble, you know, with routines. It's not the most stable kind of business for that but there's you do get into routines that one thing is you can really get when you're actually on the road you can get into some kind of routine which sure. is like you wake up as late as you can get away with and you find some breakfast and then you hit the road and you get in the van for several hours and then you get there and you sound check and then you get some dinner and then you can get into a thing of like then you check into the room again i mean i've always been a night owl so I always like going back before this when I was in high school I would get like I would be sick in the morning I just really have not been a morning person <laughs> I can do it if I have to you know <laughs> I'm a capable human being but generally that is one of the luxuries too is, but you know as I get to sleep late but I have to play late sometimes I have to be on at 2 a.m. sometime or whatever it is generally I wake up when I want and you know I have myself a late breakfast and uh you try to stay off my phone, but I don't do a good job of that. I mean, I will say, if you, you know, it's a. Uh, the pitfalls of, you know, like working for myself as a musician, and you gotta have the discipline to, like, keep getting the work done and not fall into. And I'm not, you know, I'm not the greatest with that. I can fall into laziness and play Sudoku on my phone for four hours or something. I'm like, what am I doing? You know, um, but. I always make it to the gig. I always get the writing. I always, you know, like it's it's just you know requires some self discipline. Like I guess anybody working for themselves. I would imagine you you do something musical every day. I think so. I kind of start to freak out if there's no guitar around or something. I'm looking for strings to play at some point, even if I'm just uh, you know watching TV and playing my guitar. I used to not allow myself to do that. I was like, and there's something to be said for that. A focused time on your instrument for sure. But after a while, I was like, you know, I just want to zone out to this and you know. 
play my guitar. You know, people are dying in a pandemic. I just want to play my guitar. You know, like life has become too short. Uh, so I love playing guitar, and I generally get yeah some kind of idea or write something in my notebook just about every day or listen to some music and yeah there's always something there. It comes out little by little. I just kind of like sort of it's a part of my life. It's ingrained into like the radar is kind of always on. And then I drive a lot. If you want to know about my life, I drive a ton. When you're on the road, but well, but I, it's like on the people will be like, "How was the tour?" And I'm like, "The tour? It kind of like doesn't end. It's not. It's not always so. Okay, we're on tour and then we're off tour. I mean, I'm trying to always work towards that. But how it works out is I usually end up like, I'll do a tour, then I come back, and then I got a weekend warrior for a little bit and do this, and then come back, and then there's this other tour, and then I got to fly out here and come back, and then I got to be, you know. There's a lot of bouncing around, and there's a lot of, like, I mean, I go, like, I'll fly down to Florida this week and then drive around Florida and then fly back home, but there's a lot of, like, driving around the Northeast. I'm in my car a ton. Yeah. I have arthritis in my hip from driving all these years and stuff, so tons of driving. What determines whether you're going to play alone or with a band? Is it the, the venue? Kind of. The solo thing really is so much better when it's a listening environment. If I ever get kind of caught in a loud bar playing solo these days, it triggers me back to coming up in the bars, which I did for years, and, like, it's tough. I can have a yeah. meltdown of, like, I'm not made it anywhere. I'm, you know, like, it's really hard because yeah. um, silence is the canvas on which we paint. You know, as musicians, it's like, so... Yep. And for the solo thing, it's really so powerful when it's, like, quiet in there and you can bring the room into you. With a band, I can beat people over the head and move their hips with the, with the with the rhythm and stuff much more. I can do it a little bit solo, but so yeah, the venue dictates it, and there's just a lot more to put a band show together. You know, for me, even just logistically, it's like you know, I got to get everybody there, get the equipment there, get the rooms, get all the you know. When I play a solo show, it's like I put my stuff in the car and I get there. And I've always loved doing both, so it's like yeah, it really you know you want to find the appropriate venues for both. I always looked at this job like it was a, it was more of a marathon than a sprint. You know, I called my first record Begin in 2001, maybe, because I knew, I was like, all right, this has got to be the first of many. I got to just start somewhere and call this Begin, period. And, you know, I've just always looked at it like, you know, it's going to take a while. And so my sure. career has been like watching the grass grow. And Martin's, I heard Martin Sexton say that on the radio years ago, and I was like, yeah, watching the grass grow, that's our, you know, it's... It's more fun than watching paint dry, I guess, <laughs> but it's like, yep. it's good, it's gratifying, and it comes in and the hard work pays off, you know, and um, so, but it's, you know, it's not for the faint of heart, and it's not, or it's, you, I can't imagine doing this without having that sort of epiphany to do it, that drive to do it, so it's like, if you're going to make music, you better love it, or else what are we doing here, you know, it's like, you know, I think people know that now, now there's just so much music, right? so I think part of it comes down to like the gratitude of just anybody who is willing to spend the time to listen to your music that is helping you absolutely even if it's i i've been spotify has been like great to me so it's i'm a little biased but but not through any i mean i just have benefited from a lot of people listening to my music on there so you know i understand people's complaints about oh it's only a half a penny per stream or whatever but i don't know if someone's listening to you I don't want to get... I mean, that's a whole other conversation. I'm yeah. not saying they're Spotify so great, but it's like... I've always been like... You know, early on it was CDs, and I would write... I would print on the CD, like, burn this and give it to your friends. And and there was... People at the time were like, no, it's your music is worth something. It has to do... It's like... Somebody sharing their time to listen to your music, especially right. these days, is sort of exchanging something for it. And anything you do to, like help foster that to me is like if you're in it for the long haul it's going to help you so you started this journey before you know computers really kind of took over so you were doing a lot of down and dirty stuff uh radio stations um cassettes cds uh yeah in record store stuff um, a little bit yeah. a little bit a lot of burning cds a lot of getting short runs of spindles of cds printed getting them you know it was a lot of that it was a lot of printing you know, press kits, you know, with a CD and an 8 by 10 in it and all that stuff, and uh, following up with clubs and just, you know, calling, talking to human beings. Um, and the internet has always been there, too, you know, but it was... I mean, I've always had, like, an email list since the beginning. Still have it. 
and just trying to keep in contact with anybody who cares enough to listen to this stuff. And I've done some of the radio stuff. I've hired like independent radio promoters. I've been to radio stations. I've never been, you know, huge on it, but I've been really supported by a few stations. And How has uh, the advent of social media really changed? The, I mean, I know that, again, that's a loaded question, but you find it easier, harder, different? Eh, it's just part of the deal. It's like, you know, I, I don't know. It's... I don't know. And I mean, it's a, it's like anything else. It's a blessing and a curse, you know. It's been, but for me, it's like essential. Yeah, it's a it's a way to stay in touch with people who who want to connect with your music. And for me, that's what led to like all the live streaming I did in the pandemic and stuff like that. That I was off Facebook for a while, and we put promo posts on there. And then the pandemic happened, and I was like, well, I have all these people there. Why don't I live stream for them? And then that turned into this really beautiful thing. So. You know, again, I'm not like, Facebook's great, you know, like it's, it's also fucking evil, and you know, <laughs> but it's also people on the other end that you can right. connect with, so I'm no influencer, but, maybe, you know, like, I don't know, maybe for my small people I am. <laughs> it's a great job. It's hard and it's good. So, we already have the answer to this question, and the, the answer is, there is no answer, but I'm going to ask it <laughs> sure. anyway. What would you suggest for somebody who wants to get involved with music playing out? Let's say that's their their path. They want to maybe make records yeah. and play out. Obviously, there's a million paths you can take to yeah. do that. But um, And it can be, that can sort of stifle you because you can get dizzy. And I've done this, just you get dizzy thinking about how many different ways you can go and you don't really want to make a mistake. And, and you know, there's these horror stories about making a mistake. I I think the best advice I could give is air on the side of doing do stuff go play the open mic go out take the gig if you have no other gigs going on maybe take the one you're not sure of take the crappy gigs too do, i mean you know it's, I, and, and there's something to be said for like you know having your boundaries and not wasting your energy and stuff like that but it's like you know especially if you're young and you and you're just getting into this and you you, you need reps to do it you need time in front of an audience to 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 work on your craft in ways that you don't even know about yet, you know? Right. And it, I would just really say err on the side of doing. Go do stuff. There's stuff you can do tonight. There's an open mic you can do. Go do karaoke or something. Go just get up there. And if that's what you want to do. And don't necessarily wait for the, per, you know, the perfect thing because, you know, through, you know, residue, uh, luck is the residue of hard work. Through that, through going to open mics, I met people around the scene and sort of then you'd end up opening for someone and then they would open for you and you just... You have to, you have to get out there and do it, you know. Because right. I see it in a lot of younger people. You don't want to make the mistake. You don't want to do the wrong thing. You want to put it out the right way. I get that. There's something to be said for that too. But I think people kind of err on the side of that too much, and end up not doing enough. It's like you got to put stuff out. It is. There's so many people making music out there. It's like you got to go connect with people and get it out there and get better at what you're doing. I mean, you just said it. You got to get better. You got to say to yourself at some point. I may not be good enough, but I'm going to go do it anyway. It, it, it's that weird thing of like the confidence and not. Yeah, it's right. like this. It's weird. man. It's always weird. You have to have the humility to be like, well, I don't really, you know. But I bet I you look really, back at some of your early stuff and go. Oh, God, I cringe. I can't listen to it. It's tough. man. Right. That's that's part of the deal. You know, it's like if I if I hear something of mine that I actually like, I'm like, ooh, bonus. Well, yeah, I was pretty good <laughs> on that one, you know. But that's just kind of part of the deal. You know, it's this constant like balancing act of like, you know, I'm the Zen master and I'm a piece of shit. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? <laughs> I think every artist goes through that. Every human goes through that in, to some respect, you know. And, and I do think in the there is, like I was saying, like that irrational confidence of like, you know, I remember playing at a party and like URI and I was like, I'm the shit. How come no one's listening to me? You know, like, and you know, you got to learn that humility too. Sure. But that was part of the drive to do it, to get it out there. And I was humble enough to keep learning. You know, you, everyone knows you got to keep learning. That never stops. You have to learn your craft. You have to get better at it. You, know, you just have, if, if you if you think you've just got it all down and you're good, then you're probably in trouble. But with all the hard work, I mean, you must be able to look back. And you said you cringe when you listen to your to your old stuff, but you must be proud of the growth you've made. I am. And be able to sort of see the growth by actually going back and listening. Yeah, that yeah. must be. It's pretty cool. That is cool. And it's to know that I did it. And the, 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 another really cool thing to me is that I may cringe when I hear like stuff from my first record 
or fuck my first four records or something, you know, or and, and my last record, no, uh, <laughs> you know, depending on what mood I'm in, you know, but no, but I may cringe, but I think about someone was into it at that time, someone's still into that, that record that I don't like. So that where it's, this is where it becomes like, it's the different experience for me than the person listening to it, and I can't bring my own psychic baggage into the thing and just let people. Like, it's gratifying to me to know, to know that somebody at that time, 20 years ago, really liked that record. Some people still like that record, you know. So I may not, but it's almost none of my business at that point, you know. So you know that makes me feel better. Like at the end of the, like I, you would be wrapped up so much in this that I would. I mean, I was just a wreck on the road because you're just trying to make it and you don't know if you're going to make it anywhere. And I would just be like super emotional and all over the place and just, you know, just really just intense and anxious and all this stuff. And it's like, you know, at the end of the day, we're making music like no one's going to die. It took me a long time to realize that. Like, and I still have moments where I'm a little freaked out up there. It's a heightened kind of experience, but it's just music. There's something to be said for, yes, making it the most important thing in the world, putting your heart and soul into it. And there's something also to be said for, like, a kid in the sandbox is also making music. That's just as much music as, you know, it's it's that balance. You know, you got to right. trust your inner compass of, like, okay, no one to kind of walk away. And it's at the end of the day. I remember this this old poet on my very first tour. Uh, I, was, I was selling merch for a band called Mountain of Venus and opening up for them was the first tour I ever did. And there was this old guy, Ken, he was this old hippie guy that lived in Texas. And I remember him, he, he, he could see all this anxiety I'm talking about in me. And he just looked me right in the eyes, big beard, and he was just like, it's okay. <laughs> I would never forget that. No, that's great. It's a, you know, I want to, you know, everybody should have that moment of like, you know, it's okay. Right, you know, right. Do the best you can. Absolutely. Have you ever had people come up to you and say that your music has changed them or inspired them? Or how do yeah. you feel when that happens? Oh, my God. I, I mean, it, all the time. Honestly, it still happens. All the, I mean, it, oh, that, is, that is it. That's the thing. If I, do not, if I get no other reward from this, that's like I don't even know how to reciprocate it. People have tattooed my lyrics on their bodies. They've, wow. They tell me I've helped them with their sobriety they tell me I helped them when their mother died they tell me I helped them through their own disease I mean it's you I can't even believe the you know the things that people say about it's just, it's beautiful it's that's the most beautiful thing and it's like that's a testament to like you know you just put stuff out there you don't know how it's going to affect people and so again your own psychic baggage of like oh, I could have done that better like that's valid to get better at your craft but also like when you put it out there you know put your best foot forward because it can really music really helps people music is the most obvious vibrational connection of like beings you know <laughs> it's so just kind of blatant and it's everywhere and so yeah it's amazing i've played for families who are losing someone to cancer right in front of me i've played for weddings i've played at funerals i've you know people have told me they were playing my music when their kid was born people told me they were playing my music when their kid was created <laughs> <laughs> like all kinds of, it's just you know music baby <laughs> <laughs> have you ever had anybody come up to you and say your music ruined me <laughs> you know you know <laughs> <clears throat> that would be amazing <laughs> i mean i wouldn't like to hear it but you won't you know but i honestly think people don't you, you know you you don't hear that stuff because music's like that. It's you know those. I may save someone's life with my music who thinks it's the greatest thing, and someone else may walk by with that same song and be like, "This is the biggest load of shit I've ever." You know, <laughs> I've had like when you get these weird, like kind of exposures online of like an ad or something, so it goes to other people out of your network or something. You're getting exposure, and I've had people be like, "This is the worst music I've ever heard," and it's like, and I'll be like, hey, "Thanks, Frank," or whatever, you know. Uh, <laughs> But Frank's not wrong, you know, like it's, it's, Opinion. that's okay. I have right. to be okay with it. I'm not, right. you're not going to get everybody and that's tough. I want everyone to like me. I want everyone <laughs> to like me and my music, but I can't, I got to get over that because they won't. Yeah. Um, so you don't, it's funny. Like I wonder, I almost want to, I get, I get a lot of tons of positivity, almost all positivity, which is such a blessing, but it's almost at the point where I want to be like, Hey, tell me something you don't like. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what I'm doing wrong. Because yeah. you can get in your own bubble and not hear that stuff, sure. you know. So sure. I haven't had anyone say I've ruined them. But it, it's I'm sure they're Ryan. out there. It's okay. Yeah. No. I mean, that means you're doing something right. <laughs> no. 
oh, interpretation of your lyrics. Mm -hmm. That's always a weird thing because, you know, some people hear something and, and they form their own story in their head mm -hmm. based on a lyric. And meanwhile, you've written it in a certain way. Have, have people come up to you and said, hey, this, it, I love that song, how it made you, you know, uh, when you quit smoking and, uh, and you yeah. do that and you're like, uh, that <laughs> is not, not even that. close yeah, yeah. to what I wrote that about. How, how, does that happen? Uh, yeah, there's two things. I mean, I think, uh, honestly, that's part of the strength of a song. I think, I, you know, I want to write them, when I teach this in songwriting, like a paint a picture, not a sign. You want to paint a picture that people can walk into and have their own experience. And this is an old concept that, like, many poets have done this forever, of, like, just this, this thing you kind of, you allow people to, con I mean, everyone's going to connect their own reality to it. So it should be written in a way that's like the truth is there, but people connect their own truth to it. And so a song can mean, you could play one song in front of, you know, 80,000 people and I read a quote about that recently. It's like every, you know, there's 80,000 different reasons why all those people love it. That's, you know, so there's something to be said for that. And then there's other, yeah, like it, it somebody, um, you know, I have a song called Cue the Majesty, which is like, you know, cue, like you would say in a movie, like cue the boy or whatever. Cue the Majesty is like, bring it on, bring it. And then we, I would see that on the road of like, all of a sudden you drive into this valley and it was like, cue the majesty, there it is. Mm. And uh, this kid came up at the end of this like hippie festival I played and, he was like, what is that song? I love that song. I was like, oh, it's called Cue the Majesty. It's, it's on, that's, you can get it on the CD. Or, you know, and he got the CD. He was so psyched. And then he came up. He was like, oh, I thought it was Kill the Majesty. <laughs> I was like, oh, no. But, you know, so whatever. There's stuff like that where it's misheard. Or people, when they, whenever somebody writes my lyrics online, there's always like some little word that's wrong. And it drives me crazy because I spend so much time on those on my little words. Uh, but, you know. At the end of the day. So have you met that kid since? And has he killed any <laughs> not, royals? He's, he's in jail. Uh, yeah, we don't like to talk about it. Uh, yeah, kill the majesty. That would be, might be more interesting. Your favorite tune that you've written? Oh, okay. Tough one, right? Well, this is no? a boring answer, but it's, okay. it's really true. It is honestly, whatever is the newest is usually, is really always like closer to my heart, closer to my reality, you know what I mean? And the, and. There's definitely songs I've written over the years that I'm maybe more proud of than others that stand the test of time where I'm yeah. like, yeah, no, I really got it on that. Some I keep tweaking, some never make the cut, you know, but that's like, you know, it's really true. Like whatever is newest is usually what I want to do. That's cool. Because when I go to a show and people, you know, it's, it took me, it was only a few years ago that I realized like, wait a minute. Okay. Everyone's buying tickets from me, like at this show of mine, it's weird how you spend so many years trying to win over rooms that you just it's ingrained in me that I just I'm like all right I gotta win them over and it's like no that they've been this person's been buying tickets to see you for 12 years like you're okay <laughs> but it's right you know so when I go into that room I just like I still have that thing of like well I gotta play a bunch of new stuff because that's like what's you know and it's like no they want to hear all the old stuff <laughs> right, right but I still like playing that stuff too you have sure. to you know it's my job to enjoy everything that I play right as much as I can right you know if it's really I don't want to do it then I'm not gonna do it it's a weird job. It's, you know, there's free drinks every night backstage. It's something you got to watch out for. It's not many jobs where it's like, you know. Let's talk about it's that. It's not many jobs where, like, people are selling drugs in the room at your job or whatever it is. Or, or you know, there's, there's, that can be a pitfall. I was going to say, how do you avoid the pitfalls of of, <laughs> of vices and things like that that, that kind of come your way in, in the seedy places that... Unfortunately, and the, and the business that the new music yeah. is. You know, mm -hmm. the, the real problem, I think, happens when you go home. Like, you get off this. It's one thing to be on the road and have a future. I mean, everybody's different, obviously. But when you get home and you're alone in your kitchen and everything's quiet, that's when, you know, that's when, like, the band. I read a book about the band, and, like, that's when they had the biggest problems is when they went home back when they were successful and they went home back to their mansions and they didn't have the gigs to get to and they had all the money in the world and they just had all the drugs and that's when they did it all you know it's that can be the toughest I think is the come down of that and then just learning the hard lessons over the years of like you better have community you better have friends you better have family and I'm still learning those lessons you know yeah. um, but it's it's pretty, you know, you got to take care of it. Get good food when you can get it on the road, because when you can't get it, you're going to have to eat Wendy's or whatever. But but you don't have to. Sometimes I eat better on the road than I do at home, you know. You can, it's not, it's, 
Sometimes, you know, me, Lyle used to joke about it, like, man, we just went to the Whole Foods and I had a juice and then they fed us a nice meal at the venue and it's tough out there on the road, <laughs> you know. Now we're staying in this three-star hotel. Like, nothing's too bad. <laughs> it's not, it doesn't have to be that bad. Right. I have slept on a lot of floors, too, and stuff. But I've been lucky, I think, to have, like, the hard drugs and never really been in my orbit, really, sure. and stuff like that. So, I've, you know, I just try to watch. For me, the drinking is, like... I've never hit rock bottom, but I will hit like a mediocre like, a side. You know, a bad mediocre can just kind of yeah, like it just kind of can ugh, just kind of weigh you down and yeah. I don't know. I've always done the dance with it and been able to like kind of, you know, keep my head above water. Everyone else is in there like in the club or at a festival. It's a, just a completely different zone. Like you're a musician, you got to get there for sound check, you got to check, you got to hit it at a certain time, you got to be ready to go. If you fall into, and I see people do this like maybe really early on, but you got to learn this lesson quickly. Like you're not there going to the bar like you would normally go to right, a bar. Right. I think that's so obvious, but some people really, I think, don't get. I mean, maybe at first I was like, oh, I'm at the bar, I got to get a drink. It's like, no, you fucking, you're there to work. Right. And then, right. and then, so it can be hard to hang with people afterwards because you're having your first drink when they're on their tenth. Right. So, I mean, that's just the whole thing. Yeah. Anyway, when you're on the road, I know you don't have a lot of time between gigs, but is there any time for you to do anything fun on the road and? Do you have any uh, traditions that you do on the road when you're? It's kind of luck of the draw for me. I think my agent's a psycho, and he just has. I got to have a talk with him about days off because <laughs> he's. It's very efficient to line him up, but I, it's like, man, it's like, okay, I'm doing eight days in a row, and then I'm flying home. Like, uh, we used to say the cultural imperatives were like, you know, and like food and so like in Philly you get a cheesesteak. Uh, yep. You know, if you're somewhere else, you get the seafood. You get, you know, like it, it's good to. You know, we used to go to Athens, Georgia. We would go get this, like, soul food. This place, uh, Weaver D's, was amazing. Like, just, you know, that stuff's important. That stuff's good. And I, some people do it a lot better than I do. Uh, with Stevie Van Zant from um, Bruce's band and the, and Sopranos. the Sopranos and stuff. Yeah. He is an amazing guy. To, I've seen in interviews talk about, like, he's like, you know, you don't make as much money, but he makes it a point to, like, quality of life first. He gets there a day early. He sees some stuff in the town. He has, like, another day. He's, like, very adamant about that. And that's, like, I don't do that. I need that. That's really inspirational, yeah. though. But anything you could do to, like, you know, for me, it usually just comes down to, like, you know, taking a little walk around the neighborhood, wherever the club is, finding a coffee shop somewhere, doing something to get out. Because it's really easy to just see the club, see the van, go yeah, home, yeah. you know. Yeah. All right. So I think we've determined, uh, after all of this, that you like your job. I love my job. And I went into a ton of debt to do it for years and pay for my own records, and it was really scary, and I had a mountain of credit card debt, and I just crawled through, and I knew if I just kept working, I could do it, and now it's like, you know, still have some dips, and when it, when it rains, it pours, but, but I, uh, you know, I make a living. Life is good. Yes, it is. Brian Montblou, uh, thanks for coming on Occupations and telling us about your life. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, Thanks for having me, Andy. My pleasure. Stay tuned for another episode. Coming soon. Occupations has been brought to you by LotsOfMaps.com. Please follow Occupations the Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to find information about our next episode or to see what past episodes are available. Wake me in the morning, tell me there's no time for sleeping. Tell me that today's the day we're leaving. Drive us to the water's edge, dive into my heart instead Tell me that we're home now, home is where the heart has room to dance Feels good enough for dancing I know I have an audience with you here by my side If you need some privacy, I'll walk myself outside and count to ten